This is the survival analysis video on Kaplan-Meier curves without censoring. This video will describe how to create a survival curve in the simplest possible case, that is, where none of the patients in your data set are, center, are censored. As we proceed, I'll try to convince you that the survival and hazard functions provide equivalent information. I won't precisely define the hazard function beyond saying that it represents the force of mortality. The stronger that force, the more quickly the patients in your data set will die off. If I presented you with the two hazard functions on the left, you'd almost certainly be able to correctly label the survival curves on the right. Your intuition might or might not tell you that the two figures provide equivalent information. In other words, that the survival curve is completely derivable from the hazard function and vice versa. To define the survival curve more directly, consider a data set with five patients in the times of death is given on the slide. These times could be in terms of days, months, years, and so forth. The survival curve plots time on the x-axis and survival on the y-axis. More precisely, what is plotted is the probability of surviving beyond time t. Since it's assumed that no one dies at exactly time zero, the survival curve always begins at one. Since the first death in this data set occurs at time three, exactly four out of the five patients, or 80%, survive beyond 10 months. That is, S of 3 is, is 0 0.80. Similarly, the second data set occurs at exactly time 5. At that point, exactly 3 out of 5, or 60 percent of patients, survive beyond that time, and so forth. The proportion of patients surviving beyond time t is exactly the construct that you're looking for. However, the previous calculation will fall apart when censoring is present. This slide illustrates a slightly different way of making the calculation that will also work in the presence of censoring. The fundamental insight is that for a patient to survive beyond time three, two things must simultaneously occur. The patient must be alive at the start of time three, and the patient mustn't die at time three. This insight sets up an iterative calculation as illustrated in the table. The probability the patient is alive at time three is simply the value of the survival curve at the previous time point. Probability the patient dies at time 3 is the number of deaths that during time 3 divided by the size of the surviving cord at that time. This is the estimated value of the hazard function. This illustrates the, has the estimated hazard function from the previous example. The kaplan meier procedure generates not just an estimate of the survival function, but of the hazard function as well. The actual hazard function is probably a continuous fu function over time but our estimate of the hazard is zero for times without events and jumps at the time of the events. At this point, you should be comfortable with thinking of most things in statistics as describing signal and noise. Here, the survival curve is a signal. Your intuition should also be to not consider signals in isolation, but instead to somehow attach an estimate of precision to that signal. It turns out you can do the same thing for survival curves, as illustrated on this slide. A common way to do this is through Greenwood's formula, which will basically treat us a black box. As you can imagine, as sample sizes drop, the noise associated with the survival curve will increase. 